Hey everybody, I've had some requests to do a tutorial on using Final Cut Pro to edit podcasts, or edit video podcasts rather. So this isn't going to be a fully in-depth teach you everything you need to know about Final Cut Pro. I recommend kind of diving in and learning more about it. This is meant to kind of walk you through the process of editing a podcast in Final Cut. So first things first, let's look at the interface. Up at the top, we've got various buttons. This one is the import media, the keyword editor, and this will show or hide the background tasks window. This one is here because I have command post installed. That's a utility that gives some additional controls over Final Cut. You can look into that if you want. That's kind of beyond the scope of this video. On the right side of the main top header, we have a control to show or hide the second display view. Essentially, this allows us to display some part of the Final Cut interface on a second monitor. Our options are the timeline, the viewer, or the browser. So this area over here on the left is the browser. This section here is the viewer. This is where you would see the video if we had one loaded. And then the timeline we'll see later is in this lower section. Then over here we have show or hide the browser, show or hide the timeline, and show or hide the inspector. If you open up Final Cut and your inspector is taking up the full height of your screen, if you double click on the header up here, it will change it from full size like it is now into half size. That way you have the full width of your screen for the timeline. So this shows or hides the library window, show or hide the photos, videos, and audio sidebar, and this shows titles, or hides them. So down here, I don't mess with these too much, and they're not even active until we get something loaded. This drop-down changes your selection tool, and it gives you the key commands to quickly change. Then over here, we have turn video and audio skimming on or off. We'll go over these in a few minutes when we can actually demonstrate what they actually do. So one of the big things to understand with working with a nonlinear editor is how you organize files. In Final Cut, you have three different things you can create libraries, events, and projects. Let's take a minute to really understand these. So let's think of libraries as the overall container. In our case, I would probably create a library that is named for my client, or maybe just their podcast, depending on how I'm working with them. And then next, we have events. And we can think of events as the individual podcast episodes. This is where we'll import all of the different assets used for that specific episode. And within the event, we will have our project session. This is the file where we do all of the editing. So let's create a new library. So now up at the top, we see a library called Podcast Demo. Within this library, we'll create a new event. We'll just call it Podcast Demo Episode 1. We can double check that it's in the proper library. If we want, we can check the Create New Project. We'll just use the Auto Settings. Click OK. We'll rename the project, 
and the project is now open. The next thing we want to do is import the clips. And Final Cut is a little bit weird about importing your clips. It doesn't like it when you import them directly into the library. It prefers you do it directly into the event. So here now we see we've got my audio, my or my video, my audio, Josh's audio, and his video. First thing I'll want to do here is put together a multicam clip. First I want to add a four a third video clip, and this is the auto-generated grid from Riverside. That way we've got the a shot of me, a shot of Josh, and a shot with both of us. So to prepare for creating the multicam clip, we need to click on each individual file or video file. Over here in the inspector on the right side, click on the, the eye for the info. Down here, we're looking for camera name. What this is, is really the angle number. If we use numbers, we can quickly toggle between each angle by pressing that number on the keyboard. So we'll call this one angle one. We'll go to Josh. We'll make him angle two. And we'll go to the grid and make that angle three. So now we'll select all three video clips that we want included in the multicam. Right click, select new multicam clip, give it a name, make sure use audio for synchronization is on. That way it will synchronize all of the videos. And this can sometimes take a couple minutes depending on how strong your computer is and how long the files are. Okay, I'm back. I had some technical problems. I ran out of disk space, and that is something to really be aware of when it comes to video editing. The amount of space, it adds up pretty quickly. There are a couple of things we can do. If you go into settings and import, I don't know why this keeps changing on me. For files, you want to leave files in place. Essentially what this means is if you copy, have the selection to copy to library storage location, it's going to duplicate the content. It's going to be wherever you first store it and then wherever your library is. Since we don't want to double up on storage space, we can either copy everything to the storage location and then delete it from our original location, or in my case, I prefer to just leave files in place. For analyze audio, I have remove, remove silent channel selected. My interface wants to record and show all 32 or however many channels it has, which makes it just a nightmare to work with in some regards, but remove silent channels resolves that. If you're running into processing issues for transcode, you have two options. You have create optimized media and create proxy media. The difference between these two is contrary to what it sounds like. When you create optimized media, it's actually creating much larger files because they are less processor intensive when playing back. Or you can create proxy media, which is a lower quality version of your raw video to make it easier on your system to play stuff back. If you need smaller file sizes, Create Proxy Media is going to be your choice. Then you can choose from ProRes Proxy or H.264. 
I'll let you research that if that's what you want to do. I would not recommend having both of these checked. Go with optimized media or go with proxy media, one or the other. But basically what happened when I was trying to render out the multicam is I ran out of disk space, so it created the multicam, but it couldn't optimize it. So if you're doing video and you haven't done so already, invest in a lot of storage. I use Samsung T7, T5 USB hard drives, and I also have a networked NAS with, I think, 12 terabytes that I use to store all of the old files when I'm done. As I'm editing this, I realize I did miss out on one thing. When it comes to storage space, a lot of it can be freed up by selecting an event, and this is something I try to do every time I'm done with a video. I'll select the event, go to File, and Delete Generated Event Files. Here I'll select Delete Render Files, all of them, Delete Optimized Media, and Delete Proxy Media. This can build up really quickly, and once I know I'm done with the video, that's when I'll do this. Essentially, once a video is published, I know I'm done with it, I'll delete all of this. If for some reason I need to come back to this session, Final Cut can regenerate these files. So we're not really losing anything, these are just cache files. So I'm just adding this in after the fact because it was one thing I forgot to mention during the original recording for this tutorial. And now we will continue. Now that we've created the multicam, we can drop that down into our timeline. So you can see it shows me, but if I press two, we've got Josh, three, we have the grid. So now let's go back to some of the things we skipped earlier. Index will show where our different clips, tags, and rolls are. Then we went over this. Generally, I want to have the select tool which is command or just A for the keyboard shortcut. You'll want to know T to trim, B to blade, and Z to zoom. Here we can duplicate our project. We can reveal the project in our browser. We can go to project properties. And then we can close the current timeline, or we can close other timelines if we had another one open. This is obviously our timeline. Okay, over here, to turn video and audio skimming on or off, when something is blue, it is turned on. So right now, skimming is not on. If we turn it on, for some reason we're not getting audio skimming right now. That's the way it goes when we're demonstrating stuff. The headphones allow us to solo. Snapping allows us to snap our movements to wherever we have cuts. Then this last button allows us to change our view. So we start here with a very small view that doesn't show us anything. Then we've got just a film strip view. Now we have film strip with audio. And then each one makes the audio file bigger. The last one gives us only the audio. This is the view I tend to work in because I don't need to see the video since it's already up here. This allows us to zoom in and out on our timeline, and this one zooms in on our track. So I tend to work with the track zoomed in to max. So now that we've got all of that out of the way, let's drag in our audio files. When we're creating the multicam, we could include the audio files when we do that, but the reason that I don't is we lose the view of the individual tracks. Actually, let me show you. See right here, you can see my audio interview. Now if we go up here to the speaker, 
This shows us our audio. Since we have three clips, we have three different tracks of audio. If I click two so we can hear Josh's audio and see it, it will take a minute to process, but it will show all of the mixed audio on the video track. The problems that this causes is we can't really see where the transitions from me to Josh show up. So that's why I work with the audio separately. But now that we've got the two tracks showing on the top line, we can't see where the cuts should be made. Whereas when we have the two audio tracks, now we can see where it transitions from me to Josh to make it easier to go in and switch camera angles. And the problem here with the audio is it very rarely perfectly lines up. Let's take a listen. I see used, used in different... So we can hear the audio file is not lined up. Let's check Josh. Since everybody's performances as they're actually acting in the different scenes. So Josh's audio is perfectly lined up. So what I'll do, I will just zoom in. So the first thing I'm looking for to help me align these two tracks is for a peak that's pretty easy to identify. Looks like I've got one right here on the top track. I'll move the audio on my track, my audio track so it's close to lined up, and then I'll zoom in tightly. Move the cursor again to that peak. Line this up. Zoom out, hit play. That's right. But you have a lot of background in. Okay, so we're right on. It's okay if we have a slight hollowing or phasing sound, but I try to get it as spot on as I can. So now we'll select the top clip. We'll deselect the audio for one and two. That turns off audio from the video clips. So the only audio we are dealing with are the two audio tracks I brought in. And as we can hear, we have both tracks. Yeah, in comparison. From scratch as well. One other thing I might do, depending on the loudness of the audio, if it's coming in quiet, you can select each track. And over here on the right in the inspector, click on the speaker, click on loudness, and that will automatically adjust the loudness. So I might do that on both tracks. That helps not just from the perspective of monitoring, but also it makes it a little bit easier to see everything. Now that we've got the project set up, we've got all of our assets dragged in, all of our audios lined up, we're ready to start editing. So I'll usually first thing look for where we begin. I'll see the countdown on my end. Hmm. And I haven't for the last, last few days, which is weird. Interesting. I'm done, I'm done a session in a minute, so I'll see on my next one if it does the same thing. Hey, everybody. So I'll cut here. Delete. The keyboard shortcut for cut all, which is what we want to do in this situation, is Command-Shift-B. But if you wanted to, you can customize your key commands. Go to the Final Cut menu, Commands. Customize, and then change from the default command set to a custom command. Or I guess, I guess it's called my custom shortcuts. But the default is Command Shift B. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to worry about cutting out all of the silence here. I will do that after the fact in Hindenburg. But if you're wanting to do all of your audio work within Final Cut, you can process these things as you want. Usually I want to crop in on the videos. 
especially here where we have two views where we have a pretty wide shot. So the first thing I do, I'll select my clip, go up here, I'll select the multicam, then I'll go up to the film strip inspector view, and I'll adjust the scale. So I'll go to about there. If I need to move the position, we've got X and Y control. So I try to position the head in the center of the screen as best as I can. So now we'll change, we'll press the 2 to bring up Josh's screen. We'll zoom in on him, probably drop him down a couple pixels. And then we'll leave shot 3 the way that it is. Drop him down a little bit more. Drop, bring me up just a touch. Okay, now, now we're ready to go. I'll start by zooming in a little bit, finding where those transitions are. I actually want the grid for number three. And we switch to two there. Here we've got a bit of a pause. Remember that way? That works. So I might shorten this a bit. And one thing to note is this top lane is your primary storyline. So if you select that select your piece of video, your clip on the primary timeline. When you hit delete, it will delete everything associated with that. So clips below it will also be deleted. You don't have to select all of them together each time. So we'll go back to me. We'll scroll over here. So, ish. We've got a gap here, so I'll cut that. Then we'll change camera angle. Just don't crash anything while you've... And you can tell there's a bit of latency between the two of us. So for me, this is the time to clean this up. Next time. Exactly. I do that next time. Exactly. Sometimes I can do the changes man visually. Sometimes I have to listen to it. Go through life. Mm -hmm. Everything's just... For something like this, I might... Go to the grid view since there's a little back and forth. I think that's how we all go through life. Mm -hmm. Everything's just one experiment after the other. That's right. But then I'll tighten this up. That's right. But you have a. And I'll just keep doing that throughout the entire episode. Once I'm done, that's when I'll go back and 
depending on what the client needs. Typically, this is all I do, just because there's only so much we can do with a typical podcast to hide the cuts. I mean, there's only really three ways to to hide a cut. We can use B-roll, we can use zoom in, zoom out, or we can use the morph cut. Or in Final Cut Pro, they call that the flow cut. Let's take a look at each one. So let's find a place where we do a cut. Let's cut out the sew. True. It is. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly... So we've got two things here which are going to call attention to the edit. We've got the visual jump cut, and then we have the cutoff breath. Yes, indeed. I come from a most. So the easy one to take care of is the breath. We can either cut that out completely, or we can extend it out so it's not cut off. It is. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly... So I would just cut that out. It is. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly... But we've still got the obvious jump cut here. We could go into titles. Let's do a solid custom, which is basically just a black screen. Let's say we wanted to put some text on it. This is really generic and not what I would do, but for our purposes, it's a good demonstration of how we hide a cut with B-roll. It is. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly interview editing background, so... So I might cut that down. It is. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly interview editing background. So now we've hidden that cut with B-roll. B-roll can be anything from an image to a text overlay like this to another video clip. Anything we can use that plays over the top of the primary video. We'll get rid of that. Another option we can do is, since we know we've got these two cuts, I mean, we can hide it with right here because we're changing camera shots. So we go from the grid to just the shot of me. And after the other. That's right. But you have... So there's... We don't really see the edit there. But the other way we can handle it is by changing the zoom. So let's change this one to 100%. So now when we go from this clip to the next, we'll have a change in the zoom. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly interview editing background. And let's see where our next cut's going to be. We'll make one right here to shorten that gap. So now we can choose this clip in between our two edits. Change the zoom to 100. Let's go 105. It is. Yes, indeed. I come from a mostly interview editing background, so I can't offer a whole lot of guidance or expertise in the world of I see a lot more people using this type of edit. It's less jerky, it's less obvious than a jump cut. 
but the other one we have at our disposal is if we go over here and to the right hand, I guess effects preset. Okay, we've got the effects browser, and then we have the transitions browser. So we're looking for transitions, which is the right hand farthest right icon. Go into dissolves, and then flow. We select it, we drag it to where our cut is. It will take a minute to process the video. You can watch the circle up at the top. It will show you the progress as it's analyzing the video and rendering it. While that's rendering out, just to talk about it, if you click this button, it will show you your rendering and any other background task that might be going on, and it'll show you the percentage. You can pause, you can stop it. Let's see if we can get the audio skimming to work. So this is what audio skimming is. It, you hear the audio as you skim. I tend to leave the audio skimming off. I just want to skim the video. If I don't want it to skim, I'll turn that off. But usually I have it on so I can quickly just scroll through the video. The one disadvantage to this is wherever this red line is, that's where anything you push to do something, it's where it happens. So if I wanted to change angle, even though my cursor is over here, the red line's here. When I press 2, it makes the changes the angle where I'm at. So be aware of that. So what I do is when I'm making a cut or copy and pasting, I just want to make sure the mouse cursor is up out of the timeline because then everything will occur where the, the playhead. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Okay, let's try this again. So I've undone the, the zoom in changes. So we're at the same zoom in level across here. And that's important because the more change there is between the two frames, the more processing, the longer it will take to analyze and apply the flow transition. So we want to make sure things are as similar as possible. That's why I have undone the zoom change, because if we were have this set with a different zoom like that, it's going to take forever to process and it's not going to look that good. So we'll undo that. We'll add the flow. Like I said, we can watch this circle up here. It'll show us when it's done. Usually it processes it a couple of times, but let's take a look at it now. Indeed. I come from a most so if you're paying attention, you can kind of see that we did something. Yes, indeed. I come But let's take it off and see how, how it looked before. Yes, indeed. I come from So it really smooths out that jump. Yes, indeed. I Indeed. I come from a mo Let's look at this cut. Vertice in the world. So again, this one isn't too drastic. Peace in the world. So I'm sure that will do a pretty good job. The more movement, like I was saying earlier, the more difference there is from one frame to the next, 
if my head is looking one direction and then the next frame it's looking the complete other direction, it's going to be more of a challenge. Peace in the world of... See there, it looks like a completely natural movement. Peace in the world of... Let's try this. cut that out about what what makes there's a little bit more of a drastic change in head angle about what what makes narrow let's see how all the flow does with that plus a little bit about what what makes narrative so much diff so usually i will try the flow transition first if that's not doing what i want then i might look into one of the other methods one other thing to be aware of usually the default settings with the flow transition work well but if you need to you can shorten it it'll have to reprocess but sometimes that will make it look more natural I indeed I come I think with this one it's not going to make much of a difference but the average person probably isn't going to pick up on that podcast person True. it is yes indeed I come from a mostly so those are the three ways you can try to hide or minimize the impact of the cut jump cuts are just jarring they're not most people don't like watching them but because of this it's why i don't do a lot of heavy editing with the video for podcast clients we just can't edit as tightly as we can with audio and the big reason for that is let's zoom in and you'll notice around the playhead, you'll see kind of a white bar. What that's indicating is where each frame is. With video, you can only cut on the frame. So let's say I wanted to cut right here where the audio starts. I can't. I can choose to cut at this border or this border, which is why it can get challenging trying to make cuts that work with the audio. Let me try to find an example here. This is the best example I can find to kind of showcase how we can compensate for the ability to cut wherever we want in a waveform, but not, not being able to cut right where we want in the video. The beginning of So, is cut off with Josh. Finished product. So I've. So the easiest way to do this is to just peel back the audio from before that. So that we can move the cut audio back or reveal the beginning of the syllable. So I So now it sounds natural. Finished product. So I've really gotten Sometimes we can even cut back on another track to make it sound even better. Finished product. So I've and that didn't work. So Don't, th don't get stuck thinking you have to leave everything in a perfect line. Because with the audio, we do have some flexibility. So play around with the borders to see if that will allow you to make the cut you want, even if the video doesn't quite match. So video-wise, We're cutting a little bit after he starts the word, but nobody's going to care.
O2 finished product. So I've really gotten more into And that's those types of issues where you just can't cut the video right where you want to because of where the audio starts or ends that causes the most problems when we're editing video. And it's frustrating seeing where you want to cut and not being able to. But to recap, that's the general workflow that I use. I use a multicam clip incorporating only the video elements. I manually line up all of the audio tracks so that I can see where all of the camera changes need to be made so that I can quickly go through and just change angles as needed. Usually I'll do it a little bit more zoomed in than that so I can see when there's gaps that need to be cleaned up. But it usually takes me 15, 20 minutes to go through and do an hour-long episode with a couple people. If I was doing more in-depth video editing, I would go through and do a second pass where I'm listening all the way through, probably with increased playback speed, just to catch anything I want to cut out. But when we're done with all of our editing and we want to render the clip, we have the share option. You can find that through the file menu, share, and we've got a number of destinations here. Those can also be found up here in the upper right hand corner. You can add destinations. If I have one set up for YouTube, it'll go up to 4K. For settings, info, you put whatever you want in there. For settings, you want a computer. I use H.264 Multipass for the video codec. Resolution, this gives you the options of different resolutions for the export. Audio format AAC, you can include chapter markers or you cannot include them. Roles doesn't really apply too much here but that will give you a quality export for YouTube. If we do that on the whole file, you'll see we're at 9.08 gigabytes. You can always compress this down further, or we could try a different preset. CHD 1080p. That brings it down to 6.87. Again, video files are going to be large, but when it comes to YouTube, we're not paying anything, so I have no problems uploading the higher sized resolution. It's entirely up to you to figure out what you want. Now let's talk about audio real quick. If you're going to export your audio to work in a different DAW, You'd want to make sure you've got your project file selected. Go to File, Export, XML. Then you can choose your XML version. And I'm not sure which DAWs can open Final Cuts XML. I know Hindenburg can. It needs to be converted to version 1.09. I use DaVinci Resolve to do that, and I know Logic can open it. I don't know if other DAWs can open the Final Cut XML. If you're going to work within Final Cut, there are two ways to do it, depending on your workflow. If you're going to do any processing of the individual tracks, you'd want to do that first. Select all of the tracks, create new compound clip, we'll call it Jesse Mix. That way we're applying effects to the entire, all of the tracks. 
whereas if otherwise we're applying them to one clip at a time. So now that we've got the compound clip, it automatically replaces the, the original audio. We'd go over here on the right, we'd select the effects, scroll down, and you'll see your audio effects listed. So if I wanted to, let's say I wanted to filter it, I'd grab the Pro-Q3, drag it onto the audio clip. Over here on the right side, you'll see it pop up under effects. Double or click on this icon here. It'll show you the effects plugin interface. Otherwise, you're stuck with using this to set up your EQ, which is not ideal. Then we can play the audio. So everything's working like you would expect it to in a DAW. So maybe I'd, I'd add some compression to this. And you can reorder effects by drag and dropping. And then you do the same thing for the other audio track. And then if you wanted to do any sort of I guess bus or master compression or anything where you're treating the mixed file, you would then render, let's say we've created a compound clip for Josh that we've treated, and I wish I knew how loudness was calculated because percent doesn't mean anything to me. The reason I go out into Hindenburg is I know how to quickly get my mix together, the levels are good, and get it so my output is where I want it to be. I just feel like it's kind of like pulling teeth, doing all of the audio work within Final Cut. But if we were to, say, use a limiter or apply some kind of compression to the entire mix, we could select these tracks create a new compound clip, we'll call it Demo Mixed Audio, and now we could drop our limiter on, and let's say loudness meter, so we can see how loud things are when we're adjusting our limiter. And we'd share like we would any other file. So hopefully you found this helpful and I'll talk to you next time.